Three, comes. two, one. All right. What's up, everyone? What's up? See, guys, before we, we jump into today's guest, um, I want to start by saying that, that there's something that's bothered me for a long, long time. Uh, I mean, I don't remember the exact time that there was like all the protests and, and all that about the 1%. Uh, but I think there's this misconception about the top 1%. And, and personally, uh, we, you know, I was not in the top 1% at the time of those protests. And I can tell you that I aspired to be, though. I, I aspired to be. And I think that um, I think there's a problem when our children are being taught that the 1% is something to be avoided and shamed and even even harassed. You know, like people should like, like vampires, right? But today's guest, guys, I'm so excited about this because his mission, like his singular mission in life, you know, above being a great husband and a great dad, of course, and, and running a, a very successful business, which we'll talk about, is to redefine the 1%. And he has a message today that, you know, the 1% is not about money. It's not about status. It's not about the lies uh, about, you know, the 1% are all cheaters and they're greedy and, you know, just money hungry like evil capitalists or any of that stuff. It's actually about leadership. And that's why I'm so excited to have Trevor Blattner on today. Trevor, my friend, welcome. Matt, thanks for having me, man. I uh, appreciate all the all the help you've given me to get this book out into the world and um, and just really have enjoyed getting to know you and, and uh, working together. So I'm excited to yeah, talk man. a little bit about it. Yeah, I, I'm excited. And and you mentioned books. So you just, you just, you, you broached, is it breached or broached? Breached. I'm going to say breached. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you do to a subject? Do you, I think you breach it. Yeah. <laughs> the brooch is what my grandmother wore. That's what we wear, clothes. right? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Old, yeah. I, I, um, so we'll wear a brooch and we'll breach yeah. uh, the topic. We, we, were, we were joking uh, or we were talking beforehand. Just, you know, everyone, if, if I seem a little loopy, it's I, I am I am single parenting uh, both of our children today. Uh, one of whom you. is sick. One of whom is sick while doing this and coaching calls and all that stuff. And so um, I, I looked at my wife yesterday and I mean, I almost hate to admit this, but I looked at her cause we had, we were going to have a bit, you know, my, her, the, uh, our daughter's aunt, you know, our kid's aunt was going to watch them for about, you know, most of the day. So super easy, right? Well, she's sick, hmm. you know, our daughter's sick. So it's like, we're not going to send them over there. Like, Hey, let our daughter get your kids sick too. <laughs> you know, especially because no one, one of their children's like really like, you know, if she got sick, it's like a hospital visit, you know, guaranteed. Oh, yeah. And so I'm like, well, I don't have a babysitter now. What am I going to do? <laughs> and she's like, I have them watch television. I'm like, no, we all, we agreed. We had kids. We weren't going to use the TV as a babysitter. She's like, once every 10 years is probably not going to kill them. I'm like, <laughs> Good point. So thank you, Netflix, for babysitting our children today. Um well, yeah, we'll probably talk about that because uh, we were joking beforehand that you know, one of the core tenets of this book is, is servant leadership, and and I was I was joking that like servant leadership right out went right out the window today with the kids. It's like just do what I say, and you know, daddy's going on on Facebook for you know forty five minutes, and then we can get back to, to servant leadership. Uh, and you, well, you that's said, right. And and yeah. and my comment to that was you know this is an ideal that we're striving for, you know, at all times, there's, you know, this book is really built around seven behaviors that we want to build into our lives that are research based and, and have a lot of evidence behind them. Um, you know, but, but I do think there's a tendency to get overwhelmed by the idea of, of reaching this ideal in every single day and every single moment of our lives. And, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I, but I think that, uh, that can can build resentment and frustration if uh, if you don't take the proper perspective, you know, because it, yeah. it's always striving for being a better version of the inspirational leader you want to be. So um, I think that's a great point you raise. You're, yeah. you're still a great parent, you know, even if you have days <laughs> that are not ideal uh, yeah. in your own mind. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so we, we can tell by what you're wearing. Ah, yeah. um, you know, straight that, from the operatory today. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're some sort of medical professional. I, am. Uh, I think people kind of picked up on that or you're just like super casual around your other <laughs> office there. It'd be kind of weird. Yeah. Like, what are you? I'm going to turn you where PJ is. Yeah. Work. Yeah. Um, you're okay. I'm going to see if I can get this right. An endodontist, right? 
That is exactly right. Now, well pronounced. To as well. be clear, exactly. that is not like a prehistoric dinosaur. That's... No, it's not. Not that I'm aware of. What no. what what is uh, an endodontist? So an endodontist is a, a a dentist that has gone on for further training, and I specialize in root canals and anything related to dental abscesses, toothaches, those kinds of things. So I'm the guy people call when they're in a desperate situation. And, um, and most of my patients actually are referred to me from other dentists. You okay. know? So they've had, they've had a patient come in with a big problem that they don't really want to tackle or don't have time to. And so they send them on to us and we take care of it. Oh, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're like, the, Believe it or not, we stay very busy. So you'd you're be surprised. You're the guy that you know. no one actually ever wants to see though. <laughs> not initially. Right. Right. Uh, although a lot of people come in in so much pain that they're like, do whatever you have to do, you know, yeah. just take care of it. Um, I would imagine. So, and I gravitated toward this, you know, in many ways for the same reason I wrote this book, which is, I really do find it fascinating to, to be able to help other people, you know, get out of the pain that they're in. And I think that um, you know, one of the reasons I wrote this book is I read a lot and I research a lot. And that's kind of one of the things I do for, for enjoyment is just to learn. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I learned before I wrote this book, it's just shortly before COVID that the use of antidepressants is up 400% over the last 20 years. And the, uh, and specifically between the ages of 25 and 60 years old, um, the life expectancy in the United States is declining. Um, and, and a lot of the, you know, and so, so people are dying younger, um, mm. which would, is very counterintuitive. And a lot of those deaths are, um, are not natural causes. You know, these, these are people taking their own lives. Yeah. And, and the, you know, and to me, first, that's, we might be the first ahead. generation that lives less than the generation before us. That's exactly right. In, and, I mean, and, and, like, and what, like the black plague or something. I mean, it's, right. I mean, we're talking, you know, I mean, in the modern era, you know, th this is a this is a a fundamental change that's happening, and to me, there's the reason why, and and I do think, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the role models in our society that we look up to, mm -hmm. and um, and the type of leaders that we are striving to be like and and to uh, to emulate, and so you know, I think a big part of it is if if we can learn to be the type of people that others gravitate toward in a positive way that's a huge first step and then if we can you know kind of instill those qualities and those behaviors that we talk about in the book into our own kids um then that's that's even you know a bigger step in the right direction yeah. and so that's kind of the reason i i decided to, to write the book hmm. a lot of it was selfish you know to learn for myself what's happening here and maybe how in some some way we can move in the right direction yeah, I mean, you kind of you answered the question that I've, I think was where I was going with that was how in the heck does an endodontist, you know, write a yeah. book about you know leadership and you know sure. kind of a personal development type book mm -hmm. like, um, and and thank you. I mean, because that's that's uh, there's definitely a disconnect from oh Tony oh, Robbins absolutely. wrote a book about leadership that makes sense. Yeah, you know, Brian Tracy wrote another book about leadership. Yeah, totally expected that one. You know, mm -hmm. um. And, and I think the cool thing about this is like you come at it from the perspective of a small business owner, mm -hmm. a practitioner. You know, you mentioned you came, you know, you operatory or whatever. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, said, like, you, you came from doing a root canal or something like that. You That's know, right. you're a practitioner who's a small business owner um, and you have to balance that 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 thing of like you're not just a leader in your business. You're the practitioner and the leader which I think is a unique perspective. I think that re re brings a very unique perspective because you're, you know, you're kind of like the head of everything in, in your company. Um, I am. Yeah. And, and it is a small business, you know, and uh, the other thing too is most people listening here. Um, well, I shouldn't say most many are our parents also, and, mm -hmm. and I'm a parent, I'm a dad. I've got three little girls, eight, six, and three and a half. And um, you know, when I'm not here running my small business, uh, I'm at home trying to be, you know, trying to be a dad in the very best way that I know how. Um, I fail a lot, you know, in in that capacity, just like I fail um, as a husband and just like I fail as a, a friend and a small business owner from time to time. But it's um, it's that ideal we're striving toward. And what does that ideal look like? Yeah. Um, and what are the small steps we can take each day to to do a better job at all those roles that are so important in our lives? 
And, um, and, you know, whether you're an endodontist or a, uh, or a marketer or um, anything in between, you know, these behaviors still apply in your life. Hmm. So I'm kind of curious, like the, the title of this book, I mean, it, it um, the, the title, I mean, it effectively comes from your podcast where you've interviewed a lot of people who are in, you know, the quote unquote top 1%. Yeah. What was the fascination for you or kind of the impetus for you to, to, to want to redefine what that top 1% actually means? Cause like I said at the beginning, I mean, yeah. it's, it's almost like a dirty word. I mean, you know, it's, mm-hmm. It's like, you know, it's kind of like, oh, that person has COVID or that person's in the top 1% and then, you know, stay away from them. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, like where that came from for you. Well, I think that's exactly it is, um, you know, to me, to reach the top 1% takes a, uh, a very clear vision, you know, and a very clear drive, you know, to want to be the very best you can mm. be. Um, but, but it also, to me, uh, I personally view that as um, a gift to the world. I mean, if you're able to get the very most out of yourself, you know, the very, the top 1% of your capacity as an individual. um, And if you're able to to translate that into generosity, you know, into creating jobs for other people, um, into creating a life of, um, you know, of abundance for those people in your family and, and your inner circle, um, there's nothing negative about that to me. Uh, all it is, is, is building more, uh, more capacity and more ability to help others learn to do the same things, yeah. you know? And so, you know, it, it does, you know, capitalism in my mind is a beautiful system because you're rewarded for the things you're able to create in the world that have value. And, um, and the more value you can create, the more generous you can be. And, mm-hmm. and so, redefining the top 1% is simply looking at being the very best version of yourself as a positive thing rather than, um, than an elitist sort of a a us versus them kind of an argument. Yeah. Yeah. I do kind of find it interesting that I know of nobody's running around going, I'm in the top 1%. You know, it's like, (laughs) there is no badge. We don't get like a sticker, you know, they're not handing it. The IRS doesn't like mail out a certificate. You know, you've, you've unlocked top 1% status, you know? I mean, maybe we should. I don't don't think so. I think that's the thing is like, nobody goes out and just like, they're not the ones rubbing it in. You know, I agree with that. And, and there are people that. like pro, the irony, of course, and I know you get this, but like the irony is it's like you're tweeting against the top 1% from your $1,200 iPhone. <laughs> we like, don't talk really? about those things out loud though. Do yeah. We? <laughs> but you're it, like, if you look at it, there's not a single American who's not in the top 1% globally. You know? Oh, glo- so, from a global perspective, no question. And, and, and yeah. we as Americans don't even, that doesn't even register on our radar of reality. You yeah, know, uh, but it's a great point to bring up when you look globally. I mean, we're uh, we're just an incredible uh, abundance in our country, it's and crazy. I think that that's a that's a beautiful thing because if we can learn to use that in a way that gives more life to the world rather than taking it away, I mean, what more could you ask for than than to use those gifts we've been given? Yeah, and I think one of the things I got kind of an underlying message of this book is actually something that. Um, I've, I've applied from a marketing standpoint, from a business standpoint is, and I think we need to ap- apply to a geopolitical standpoint. So I'm getting mm-hmm. like really deep here is yeah. in marketing, you look at, okay, what worked, what worked over the last three months? And you say, I want to do more of that. Mm-hmm. Oh, this worked, you know, this type of email works. So do more of it and see if you can ramp it up. And, and here it's like, okay, we're the most unique country, you know, politically speaking, you know, system, uh, you know, systematically speaking, Mm -hmm. Uh, in the history of the world. And instead of like, what if we did more of that? It's like, no, let's, let's change it. You know, I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. Like more people should want to do more of the thing that's working. Uh, When we know what works, why, why are we tweaking it? Yeah. Yeah. And that was kind of one of the things I got from the book was like, again, it's an underlying message is, okay, this works. So how do we lay into these principles and like really, really like almost put them on steroids. And one of those principles that that you talk about in the book is is this concept of shepherd leadership. Yeah. And so I have a vision, but before I read the book, I had a vision of what a shepherd was, you know, Mm -hmm. and, you know, shepherd protects his flock and, 
you know, there's scripture to that and things like that. But sure. I just like, how would you define, actually, before you define it, and maybe you'll answer this, maybe you'll define it while answering this question. Yeah. Where did that idea come from of, of shepherd leadership for you? Yeah, well, I was, where it came from was I was trying to articulate this idea of, you know, sort of the opposite of, um, you know, the, the prototypical alpha leader, you mm -hmm. know, that is sort of strong arms his, his team to get his will um, you know, done. And, and, and that to me has been shown over and over to be, uh, let me just say, not the most effective way to lead people and to have them motivated to, to be on your team. And, uh, you know, servant leadership certainly is part of shepherd leadership because we want to, um, we want to serve, um, those members of our team in a way that, that helps give them life. But I think the, the expansion on that is that, uh, you know, a shepherd is a protector, you know, and he's, um, motivated by by sort of guiding protecting laying out a vision uh and a path for you know the sheep for lack of a better term but but in in our modern society for for your tribe or your team you know and so those are kind of the key characteristics um that i wanted to define and, and create a set of behaviors that would sort of create that type of a leader um, if you do these seven things and you build these behaviors into your life you will be this type of leader that people will resonate with. Um, and, you know, I am a Christian. And so I, I do get a lot of my ideas, you know, from what the Bible has to say about what's effective in life, you know, um, and what's very ineffective in life. And, you know, obviously, you know, Jesus Christ is sort of in his own category as, uh, as a human being um, that is also divine. And then also, uh, uh, so the, the prototypical leader, but, uh, the person that I really, uh, that was just a human being that I modeled a lot of this off of was, uh, was David, you know, the character of David from, from the Bible. Um, everyone knows the story of David and Goliath. Um, and he was a shepherd boy, you know, he was basically underrated. He was, um, you know, sort of seen as just this runt kid. He was the youngest brother of a bunch of brothers. And, uh, you know, he sort of makes his mark by, being the only one with the courage enough to confront Goliath. And, and, uh, and so that sort of starts him on his path. And then the rest of his life throughout the Bible is very fascinating. And, and he makes lots of mistakes, but the whole way through his life, all the mistakes he made, um, he had a very deep commitment to, um, you know, to what he knew his life was supposed to be. Mm. And, uh, and his heart was, he, he had a specific type of a heart that I think um, the shepherd leader entails. Um, and, and so when you build all these seven behaviors together, it sort of changes your character uh, on a fundamental level, which is kind of the goal um, of becoming the type of person that, that is a shepherd leader without uh, having to think about it. You know, you mm. just are that person. Yeah. What are some of the ways that like David, because I, I, I honestly, mm -hmm. before I read the book, I, I, I didn't really, I don't guess I just didn't read it close enough. <laughs> sure, you know, sure. I didn't see him as like a particularly, I know he accomplished a lot as a leader, you know, historically yeah. speaking, um, you know, forget about the, the spiritual side, forget about the, you know, like any of the supernatural stuff in his story. Like, you know, there are mm -hmm. things that he accomplished that are pretty impressive. You know, anytime yeah. a king expands the empire, they're doing something right. You know? Sure. Yeah. I don't know, kind of some, sometimes they did it like Genghis Khan, you know, mm -hmm. he didn't. Uh, so I'm like, what are some of the specific things that you saw in the life of David that were like, okay, that's my, that's my that's prototypical, a, my prototype for a, a servant or something. Yeah. Shepherd. I mean, that's a great question. So number, you know, the foundational behavior, number one in the book is called embrace radical responsibility, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of, I feel like it's the, the opposite of entitlement and victimhood, you know, and, and it, until you're able to sort of become that type of person, um, none of the other behaviors will be able to take hold. And so, um, you know, one of the things about David that I always found impressive is that he, until he was very, very old, you know, and too old to go into battle, he was always on the front lines. You yeah. know, when, when, when his troops were in battle, he was there. And he, uh, he held himself accountable to Except being there. <laughs> <laughs> well, so right. So, when, so with Bathsheba, I assume you're talking about that. Um, and so that was when he he had stopped going to battle at that point in his life. Um, so and, he had, and, I didn't know that. I thought he was still younger. No, he, he wasn't. 
he oh, wasn't. Okay. He was. He he wasn't old old, but I believe he was in his sixties. Um, but the yeah. you know that was one of the first times where he had decided, you know, I'm going to take my foot off the gas here, and oh, I'm going geez. to I'm going to lay back and I'm going to let my my warriors fight on my behalf, and you see what happened. I never thought about that. You know what? David was mm-hmm. bored. He was bored. He was, he, was ha- he had nothing to do. And that's what led to that whole fiasco. I never thought was, about that before. He was stagnant. His life had, uh, I mean, I, you know, I think he, he took his foot off the gas. You know, I think that that is kind of what happened and his energy. Um, well, you, we talk, I talk a lot in the book about, about energy and how, uh, how we manage our energy is such an important piece of, mm-hmm. um, how effective we can be. And, you know, that has to do with sleep, of course, but it also has to do with how do we channel our energy? You know, I mean, we, there's lots of different things we can spend our energy on that are productive and there's lots that aren't. And, um, and he ended up moving his energy from something that was incredibly productive to something that was incredibly destructive, yeah. which in his, in his case ended up being, um, you know, taking another man's wife and, um, and then having the other man killed. Um, so that he could cover it up. I mean, it got really, really dark, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I think another piece of that is, is that, that David was very, very human, even though he was incredibly um, effective as a leader. And so I think that's a big piece of, of all of us is like, you know, even as you strive to be excellent, like the humanness in you is still going to be there. Um, and so behavior number seven, actually, it's called be still and know, and it's based on, uh, a passage in Psalms, uh, mm-hmm. 46, 10. And, and it's essentially, you know, recognizing how important faith is. Um, and I think that's something that's a little bit, maybe, I don't want to use the term unique, but it's, it's a bit unique about this kind of shepherd leadership philosophy is, is the importance of, um, you know, a higher power and recognizing that there are going to be things that seem overwhelming to us that we don't think are, are doable as we strive toward this ideal version of who we think we want to, we want to become. Um, and that's where we have to rely on something bigger um, and, and, and cultivate that idea uh, of that, that we can't do it all alone. You know, yeah. um, it takes other people for one, but it also takes, um, you know, something supernatural that, that I think is, very helpful if you can cultivate that type of a, of a spiritual life. Yeah. Well, guys, we've been talking, we've got, I've got more to talk with you about Trevor, but we've been talking about this book, redefining the top 1%. And uh, so two things for you guys today. And if you're watching the replay of this, we'll put these links. Uh, if you're watching the replay on Facebook or YouTube, the, these links will be in the comments. Uh, if you're watching it, you know, later on my website, it'll be below this video. If you're listening to this later, Uh, It'll be in the show notes. So just no no matter what, like you don't have to write these URLs down. You can click them from wherever. But if you go to mattmcwilliams.com forward slash Trevor, T-R-E-V-O-R, you can get a free copy of Trevor's book. Now you're going to be pre-ordering it. um, So it'll take a little bit to get to you. Just, you know, not like months, but, you know, a couple of weeks or so to get to you. You'll be pre-ordering that, pre-ordering that book, but you can get a free copy. You just pay for shipping and handling. So I'm going to tell you right now, uh, I know this because I've run 15 to 20 of these types of, uh, of book launches with, uh, with a free, you know, just pay shipping and handling. Um, and we're going to run one ourselves about a year from now. I'm going to tell you right now, he ain't making any money off this. <laughs> like uh, if you live in the continental United States, he might make a few cents per book. If so just know that I know this is like, you know, U.S. and maybe was it U.S. only or U.S. and Canada only, Trevor? U.S. and Canada. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if you're outside, it's actually cheaper for you to buy it on Amazon uh, through your um, like, you know, whatever your country thing is for Amazon. So just go to your Amazon, look for redefining the top one percent and and buy it there. It's significantly cheaper. It'll cost you, you know, less than 20 bucks to get it there versus uh, the free book with sh- with Trevor shipping it here from the United States might cost you like sixty seven dollars. <laughs> so uh, go grab a copy of the book and devour this. When you get it now, um, you know through uh, through that link, uh, you have an opportunity to get the audio book as well for not much. Like, and if you're like me, I'll tell you now one of the the best lessons I learned about 
five to seven years ago that has helped me so much to retain information because I am, uh, I'm mostly an auditory learner, but I also have uh, some entrepreneurial ADHD. And so I'm listening to a book and my mind goes over there, you know, and I'm like, wait, what did they just say for the past 20 minutes? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if I read the book while listening to it and I listen to it on about two and a half to three X speed, I pick up on everything. Then I can highlight, I can circle, I can write notes, I can do all that stuff. So grab a copy of the book. You get that for free. Just you know, ship it to you, pay for that. And then grab a copy of the audio book too. I think it's 17 bucks, maybe Trevor, don't quote me on that. 17 bucks um, for the audio book. Yeah, 17 yep. tech. Again, I know how much it costs to produce an audio book. He's not making any money on this basically. Mm -hmm. So um, go do that because I know he wants to get this message out there. Secondly, if you're interested in promoting this, you're like, oh my gosh, I have an audience that would love this book. I want to promote this to them. If you go to mattmcwilliams.com forward slash what's up, scroll down a little bit, look for just or command F or whatever it is on windows. I don't know. Um, <laughs> something involving the letter F like <laughs> or alt or something. Uh, but you know how to do it. Find type in the word Trevor and, and Robbie just actually popped a link in directly to it. There It'll it is. take you down to that launch. Uh, or to the information on that sign up as an affiliate and we'll get you information on how to promote it. So with that said, I uh, want to make sure we got that in. I, I'm kind of curious, like with you, you mentioned earlier, you, you kind of, and you glossed over it because I know you want you're talking about something else, but you mentioned that like the stuff in this book is research based. Yeah. Research based, I should say. What does that mean in terms of, of this book? Like what, what type of research were you pulling on uh, for, for this book? So a lot of the research is, uh, is behavioral psychology. Okay. Um, and it's, so I, you know, my training, you know, I'm, I'm an endodontist. So my training in residency, uh, was very, very heavy in the, um, you know, the scientific literature. And so I, I wrote peer reviewed papers. I reviewed peer reviewed papers. And so I put a lot of weight on what the, the scientific evidence has to say about, you know, what's, what's really, um, what's really workable and what's not. And so, um, you know, all the exercises in the book, I, I need to count again, but I think there are about, uh, there are over 20 individual exercises in the incorporated within the book. Um, and then if you get the, ex yeah. And okay, there you go. And if you get the, ex yeah, if you get the expanded workbook, then it's, it's more like 50. Yeah. And so, um, you know, these are, are intentionally in there so that as you're reading, you know, you stop, you now you get your journal out and you go through and do the written exercises so that you can actually build these behaviors into your life that already have scientific evidence backing them um, and and really get some traction. You know, that, that, you know, you put you put the time in to read the book, you're getting a, an abs, absolute uh, outcome, you know, mm -hmm. from from the exercises. And so to me, that's really important. I mean, we're all very busy and you have to be very careful on on how you spend your time and you want it to be fruitful. And so if people are going to read this book, I want them to get a lot out of it. And, wow. and that's why I wanted it to be scientific, uh, you know, backed by scientific evidence. Well, and I, and I appreciate that because um, I think there's a lot of books you can read and you just have more information in your head. Right. I'm listening yeah. to the book right now about the history of special operations, you know, in the United States military, I don't expect to really apply any of that information. It's just going to be, I'm sure it's very fascinating. Right? It's really fascinating. Yeah. But mm -hmm. now that I know like the whole, you know, geopolitical structure of the Somalian government, what the heck am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> I'm not listening to it to change my behaviors or change my life. So it's my advice trivia is, night though. Yeah. Oh man. If, <laughs> if anything comes up about black Hawk down, I don't even, right. I've never even seen the movie and I know a lot about it, but you're the guy. Um, so here's the deal. Like don't skip the exercises. Um, like this is about behavioral change. Mm -hmm. This is about like at the end of the book, the best testimonial, the best feedback that Trevor could get is here's what changed. That's I right. went from this to this. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that's the thing I love about this book. And again, that's why you should get the audio book and the, the, you know, the written book, because you can like listen to the audio book, kind of soak in the information, especially if you're an auditory learner like me. Mm -hmm. And then go back and read through the exercises and actually do them. Grab a, grab a notepad or journal or you know whatever, um, and write out your answers. So, 
you mentioned earlier a thing you went, I want to go back to one more thing uh, before we wrap up. You mentioned kind of yeah. the negative role models in today's culture, today's society. You mentioned David as a positive yeah. role model. I'm curious, like, are there any other positive role models that you think of when you think of, you know, shepherd leaders, um, like ideals, people like yeah. that? Well, you know, I, I can sort of look in recent history um, at, at some of those. And I look at, um, I'm a big sports guy, you know, so I look at John Wooden. Yeah, um, he him. was the, uh, the great UCLA basketball coach. And I've read a lot of his books. He wrote a lot after he retired from coaching. Mm -hmm. um, and he's got the, uh, the pyramid of success, you know, and some of the different, um, you know, his models of, of, of leadership. And he was a guy that uh, really cared, even though he was very successful, he cared a lot more about the type of men he was able to create um, through his, his interaction with them. Um, and you look at guys like Bill Walton that played for him, um, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, like they still talk about the influence that he had on their lives as men um, today. You know, and 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 he's been de he's been gone for a while, and so yeah. uh, he's a person that that I talk about in the book quite a bit. Um, that had a really major impact. I look at at Mike Shashevsky uh, at Duke. Whether you love Duke basketball or you hate it, I, I, I hated I hated it. Yeah. I could yeah. I, had to, I had to pretend that page wasn't in there. Oh, so you're you're not a Duke guy, which I understand. My That's dad okay. went to Wake Forest, and uh, oh wow, so I so uh, Tim Duncan and company <laughs> yeah. up at Wake Forest, yeah. Yep. Um, well, then, of course, you're, you know, if you're an ACC guy and you didn't go to Duke, then then this will be hard for you. Uh, but actually, I'm a University of Kansas guy. So, you know, Bill Self is my guy. And before him, Roy Williams. Um, and I love both of those two. But yeah. um, I think that I've always been fascinated by the the way that Coach K has been able to do it for so long at such a high level, you know, year in and year out. There's something interesting there. And so, um, you know, those types um, – I also look at like an Abraham Lincoln, you know, he had, he had qualities. Um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Had qualities mm -hmm. that, that really uh, exemplified the types of behaviors that we really are trying to, to build, you know, into our lives. And, and none of those people that I've named are perfect human beings. You know, that they, they all, if you dig deep enough into their lives, yeah. there's some real dark stuff there, mm -hmm. you know, um, even the very highest level people, and so uh, I think that's an important point is that um, none of us are going to reach the ideal every single day, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be striving for it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be, be running toward it at all times and, and having it kind of in our line of sight each, each day. But it's hard to do that if you don't know what it looks like. Um, and so I think this book is really like, these are really just the seven things. If you do these things and, and become the person that focuses on these behaviors every day, you'll change your life. You'll transform yourself into something that's, that's better than you are now. That's uh, so very true. I can, I can tell you, um, I don't know what Robbie would say, you know, cause he's kind of on the front lines of seeing <laughs> my evolution. Um, I, I can tell you that, you know, your book Trevor has played, has played a part in that. I think mm. um, you, when you and I spoke, we, we spoke about a year ago today. I mean, give or take, it was like, it was like a year ago, I think, maybe even yeah, June of last year. Time, that time goes to, quick, doesn't it? You're like, yeah, hey, no, you're right. I'm writing this book, and could you help? And um, yeah. I think I may have told you no at first. I don't remember. <laughs> you know, it was just like I, I think at the beginning, may have been, you may have been covered and, up, you know. Yeah, I was just, I was, you know, that's what I tell people. I tell no to 90, you know, 5% of people that reach out, not because yeah. I don't want to help, but because I, like, you know, uh, well, we only have so much room on the calendar, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the reasons why we're starting an agency, you know, so I can help more people. But, um, but I was fascinated by the idea of this book and it was, the timing could not have been better. And I was actually super blessed because I got, you know, you sent me the, the PDF back in maybe J January ish. Yeah. So that wasn't even, uh, well, maybe that was just finally the final version. I think it was, uh, yeah, I think I yeah. did get the final, mm -hmm. the final, final version, you know, and so I read it at a really good time because honestly, the truth is if I had read it a year ago, I don't think I would have been in the right frame of mind to read it, but it, it's definitely played uh, an important role in my evolution as a leader. And uh, hopefully I'm glad you mentioned, not in the background going, 
what is he talking about? He, <laughs> he sucks, you know. We'll talk <laughs> later about that. Yeah, I think <laughs> Robbie would say, you know what? And he can come on and, and argue, you know, disagree with me or <laughs> or uh, or nod his head yes. But I think he would say um, Matt's made a, a big improvement in the last six to eight months um, as a leader. So I hope that that's um, visible. But we've talked that's a lot awesome. about other people. You know, we've talked yeah. about Martin Luther King Jr., John Wooden. By the way, I don't know if you've ever read um, the the biography of him. It's just called Wooden. Um, it's written by like a uh, probably writer. pieces, but um, ESPN writer. Um, I'm going to have to pick it up because I, I find him fascinating as a human being, you know, just his, you. his trajectory from, you know, growing up in small town, Indiana, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Didn't he? And, he was, uh, and then outside of South Bend at the Mart Martin. Something yeah. Or? And I think he went to Purdue. Right. Yep. And then, then our began, daughter was began his, yeah, began his coaching career and then the rest is history at UCLA. So, yeah, it, it's fascinating. And it does. The cool thing you touched about or talked about was like, it touches on some of those, you know, that he, he screwed up. He did. You know, he, he made mistakes. And I think the cool thing about it is he, he learned from them, you know, mm -hmm. like when, when college basketball. And he didn't, and he didn't, he didn't try to hide them either. No, when know? college basketball was becoming integrated, he kind of bungled that whole effort. Yeah. Um, you know, and he had to learn, you know, and then as things changed in the sixties and seventies, you know, he still, admittedly you would be self say you know, he would self declare like i'm stuck in the 40s and 50s you know mm -hmm. and then yet he still got you know that's the amazing thing is like he got guys like lou al cinder you know kareem abdul jabbar mm -hmm. and bill walton who were both like huge hippies oh totally <laughs> to totally. come play for like this straight laced you know i mean like, they had to wear their socks at a certain yeah. height on their you know he, everything was by the book and and how did bill walton do that you know you look how, at his how life they drive at, at you know yeah. for john wooden like how, yeah. how did that even happen but and I think they still i mean they're still just enamored by him as a man you know so they love to him. me that that tells you all you need to know about the type of leader that that he is yeah so so we talked about all them and i'm curious about you trevor is there something that you could point to that's particularly unique about your personal approach to leadership. I know you, you've learned from yeah. Abraham and you've learned from Martin Luther King. You learned from John Wynn. You learned from coach K even, you know, yeah. thank God he's retiring. Um, <laughs> but like, what about you? What, what's something about your approach to leadership that might be a little bit unique or, or maybe not so unique? Well, I mean, I think uh, that's a good question. I hadn't, I hadn't necessarily thought about that ahead of time, but I'll shoot from the hip. So, I mean, I think that one thing is, in my particular business, for example, you know, I don't have a huge team, you know, so there's, um, there's under 10, you know, at any given time, myself and, and less than 10 other people. Um, and so it's important to me in that kind of a setting to be, uh, have really close relationships with the people that I'm, you know, in a, in a leadership capacity with. Um, and so I want to know about their lives. I want to know, mm -hmm. I want them to know that I care about their lives. Um, I want to help them in any way that I can. Uh, I want them to know all the things that are uh, going on in my life, um, especially the stuff that's not great, you know, because, um, you know, I'll just be forthcoming. The last few months of my life have been some of the more difficult. Um, and I, I believe in spiritual warfare. And I actually do believe that, that me promoting this book um, has allowed me to be, you know, uh, under the gun or, or sort of a target um, at this time. And so, you know, when you deal with crisis as a leader, the way you deal with it and the way that you're able to uh, persevere and, and learn from it, I think is extremely important. And so I try to be um, as transparent as I can with with those people that are on my team about what I've tried to do and what I have done well and what I've done really poorly. Um, and so there's another really good book um, called Leading with a Limp. Um, it's by a, a guy named Dan Allender, I think, and he's a He's a behavioral psychologist slash uh, counselor, uh, mm. and uh, and I'm not telling you to buy that book instead of this book, but <laughs> but either way, it's a book worth looking into for anybody that has a hard time um, owning their own shortcomings if they're in a leadership role. Um, because I do think that what that book points out is that um, sometimes our weaknesses, if we own them, can be our greatest strengths. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that that's an important thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to, I wanted to have everybody just 
think through whoever's listening to this or whoever may eventually, there's a few questions I think it's important for us to ask that I try to ask myself that are in the book and, and the book kind of leads you to these the whole way through. And so one is what impact will you have made in the world through your, your leadership capacity? Mm -hmm. A second one is what positive influence will you have had on other people, particularly those you lead and how will the world be a better place because of you? And so, I mean, if you can kind of, you know, have those questions in the background or maybe on the wall, you know, in your office all the time. I mean, I do think that over time, as those kind of seep into your subconscious mind, they will influence the way you act, you know, and they'll influence the, the types of decisions you make and, and, and what you use as, as high priorities in your life. And um, it helps you stay on track when it's easy to get off track. Yep. No, that's, that is so true. And again, guys, um, grab a copy of the book. Make sure you do the exercises that, I mean, Trevor just named three of them there. Um, mm -hmm. There are more. Um, in fact, I think there, there are a couple that are particularly powerful. And I would recommend doing those. So grab a copy of the book. It's totally free, except for shipping and handling. Mm -hmm. uh, just grab that. If you're, if you're like me and you would benefit from listening to it, either while reading or uh, again, what a lot of times what I'll do just to, re I'll just tell you guys what I do to really let things soak in. I think this was the fifth or sixth book I've ever done this with because uh, I started doing this about a year ago with Think and Grow Rich. I read that back in college. So good. Uh, I was like 20 years old when I first read that book and I hadn't read it until last year again. But I, I would listen to it and listen to it and listen to it. And so I'd like take, you know, 30 minutes of it, 40 minutes of it. And I'd listen like two or three times. And then I would read while listening to it. And it was just, it got like so soaked into me. You soak it in. Yeah. 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 Instead of just like more and more, more, more information, more information. Cause that's my tendency. And like I can read 50 to 75 books a year and, you know, then listen to another hundred, you know, well, what's the point, right? People. If you don't, yeah. if you don't have anything, that you're, that you're gaining, that you hang on yep. to from the book. Yeah. So grab the audiobook. Maybe just try that with this one. Make this the first one you do that with. Since for about less than 27 total dollars, mm -hmm. you can get a physical copy and the audio book. And maybe do that. Like maybe listen to it one time through and, and mm -hmm. feel free to do it at 1.5 to 2x speed. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, sounds like a chipmunk, but whatever. <laughs> um, and then, you know, you've, you've heard Trevor's real voice. So, you know, do that, like listen to it one time through, just not really trying to like gain anything, just really to mm -hmm. kind of get some overview and then maybe really dig in, including reading it and doing those exercises. Um, try that with this book, make that the first book that you do that with. If you haven't yet, that would be my, my challenge to you. So, you can grab a copy of the book at mattmcwilliams.com forward slash Trevor. Again, if you're saying, my gosh, I want my entire audience, or I, I know there are a lot of people in my audience that they need this book. They need to understand shepherd leadership. They need to understand how to lead a team. Uh, they need to understand like why the top 1% isn't evil. Um, whatever it is, you know, they, maybe you got parents, you know, um, you've got parents and, and they believe that like, uh, the top 1% is a force for something good and that you want your children to believe the same, right? Mm -hmm. Then you should promote this book. Um, if you think that the, if you believe that the true hope for our country lies in raising our children, right? Not in who's in the white house or who's in Congress, then promote this book, Amen. right? If you believe that capitalism is a force for good, if you've got an audience, it's like, you know, it could be conservative, libertarian leaning, Definitely. If you've got a group, an entrepreneurial audience, small business owners, um, even corporate leaders, nonprofit leaders, people like that, um, you should promote this book. So just go to mattmcwilliams.com forward slash what's up. Scroll down a little bit. You'll see Trevor's book launch there. Sign up because as you can tell, it's going on now. Um, so find some space in your calendar. Get out one email. Uh, get out a Facebook post. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try to as much as possible to maybe if you can interview Trevor, I know his schedule is packed. We'll see if we can do that uh, and get this information out to your audience. So those are my two calls to actions to you. Go do those things. And Trevor, my man, thank you so much, buddy. This has been awesome. Matt, thanks for having me, man. I loved it. And I appreciate you guys very much. And with that, Robbie, you can turn off the live stream now. Robbie's in the background.